very, very difficult to follow that fantastic presentation. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, I, I definitely agree with the former speaker in terms of attending these conferences, uh, especially the last one that I attended here uh, was a really fantastic way of learning. My job is, uh, is an easy one and hopefully it's gonna be a little bit of fun for the panel. I'm gonna be talking about technology and I'm gonna be talking about some exciting technology stuff we've heard a lot about, blockchain, metaverse, crypto, I'm gonna be, if time permits, uh, just quickly do a 30 second spotlight on two things that I've recently liked that, that are touching and connected to these technology trends. Uh, but uh, more specifically, we, I wanna talk about some valuation and some thinking about the technology space. I wanna burst the tech balloon before we get started, which is gonna be fun, so I just gotta get started. Right, first thing, technology is a tool. Uh, and for a long time, it's one that avoided investment physics. So people just thought that because the word technology was in a business, it could be worth all of a sudden a huge amount of time. And in its spare time, technology eradicates business models and completely upends very, very well established companies. A lot of businesses like Kodak that we all used to know about very, very well, we can barely understand and recognize from their current phase as they were unable to capitalize on one uh, technology shift and pivot to another wave. And the industry is full of a lot of name brands that used to mean a lot to the world like Compaq that now we don't even re remember barely in, in our own industry, in our own spaces. So, and the technology industry is also filled with a lot of hype and a lot of stuff. So the first one is I'm gonna park this on this slide quickly and see, does anybody understand what could be wrong potentially with this picture? No points for guessing. Uh, Abraham Lincoln couldn't have possibly said that. FinTech wasn't invented uh, when he was around, but it's amazing how many uh, people make up quotes and stuff in FinTech and tech presentations. So I just thought I'd draw your attention to that. Next thing is to really talk about the major, major shift. So if we wanna go through what the market actually, every time there is a 10X, 20X, 30X boost in value, and there's a massive, massive wave, Research tells us that it's the interface. It's actually the thing that you use that actually allows the back end of how you use it to evolve, which then focuses and drives the actual value. So the first thing we all started using in technology was the keyboard. And the only thing you knew was the keyboard. And it was a black screen with some green text and you had to type it and you had to know a lot about everything. The language was deeply technical. To approach a computer, you needed a lab coat and you'd be involved in a piece of technology that cost about as much as you know, a capital asset and anything else. An air, a mainframe would cost as much as a jet aircraft in some cases. And in order for you to access technology, you would need access to that capital. The technology wasn't networked. It was only able to interface with itself at work and it was corporate only. So during the keyboard generation, it required a lot of specialization to use techn technology and it wasn't really that relevant. Then somebody decides to invent this mouse thing or the human XY interface generator as it was known by the original patent. And what that allowed us to do is to get out of an individual thing of typing and to create by inference actually logical windows. So would it be interesting if we could have a different program doing a different thing at a different time? And just like the terminal emulator software was the key app of the keyboard generation, the browser became the key app of this client server generation. At that point, computing became personal. It became automated. We started automating life things. Booking travel became possible. Booking a whole bunch of stuff became possible but only from your computer, only from your device. It was difficult at the time to do a whole bunch of stuff. And I actually joined Microsoft at that phase. I spent 15 years hard labor, uh, sorry, uh, employment at Microsoft, it was fantastic. But it was just at the time before everything was universally connected. We were still thinking that fighting for the browser at the time would be the most important thing. We just launched uh, you know, Windows 95, the amazing thing was, is that if you used our product, it would be really quick and easy for your modem. You remember that? For your modem to connect to your internet service provider. And you might even get, if you were lucky, 33.6 kilobits of transaction. At this point though, we did assume that the network became 
uh, connected. And we became connecting certain small applications at home and throughout the time it evolved. And then finally, touch and the computational power of a mainframe, or basically a thousand times more than what launched the first moonshot, became available than everybody's average phone. So now what you carry around with you is more powerful than the computational power that existed in the planet Earth, all put together in 1972. And you carry that in your phone and you carry that in your pocket everywhere you go and you've got independence and you can do a whole bunch of stuff. So with that, every time that that glass shift towards touching things and having sensors and devices and cameras, those things caused a shift the, for the third time. And this time it wasn't just to a client server data center in your company, it became a cloud data center in the sky somewhere that you didn't care about what it was. And you didn't care even about things like privacy anymore. You are very willing to exchange and put your data in some data center in the sky, provided that if you lost your iPhone, you could quickly just type in a button, lock out the other one and download a copy of your data. So you became, for the first time in this new touch generation, willing to trade your data and information about you to the market, which becomes a very interesting thing. The interface has changed everything. So the tech landscape has basically now evolved into three different pillars of value that if you're looking at value in a company or investing in, you need to think about. First, I can help you do stuff. And that most tech companies help you do stuff. And that's a digital channel of any source and from anything of a normal company like a supermarket that now has an online shop, an airline that now gives you its own channel. There have been millions of companies all over that now use technology to help you do stuff. And the general model of those types of technology companies are like the old, but just faster and better. Then there's a different type of company that helps others do stuff. And those are the cloud infrastructure and bigger providers. There are guys like Amazon and Microsoft and IBM that have gigantic platforms that offer anything as a service. You've probably heard it now. Finance as a service, banking as a service, insurance as a service. All of these AAS business, as a service businesses that are effectively appliantizing what used to be very, very complicated things. And now you can all of a sudden, instead of buying a bank, buying a banking license, buying the customer buying the technology, putting it all together. Now you can just use a banking as a service provider and your application can be going from prototype to implementation in seven days. So that is where the, they're really aggregating and having a huge model evolution. The problem with that is that it's an economy of scale thing and it's an arms race. Basically speaking, whoever has got the most technology and whoever has got the most ability to invest in capital in these large as a service providers will begin to start dominating. Eventually, the world needs some type of standardization and technology and it will drive these types of behaviors. And then finally, there are the reduced friction kind of companies. And these companies have a constantly eroding value proposition. A networking company has got a constantly eroding value proposition. A media company with a specific technology has got a constantly eroding value proposition. Sky Broadcasting, B Sky B, was the darling of the early 2000s in the UK because they had these satellite dishes and things in the sky. And if you put a dish out outside, which is kind of annoying, you're not gonna put a second sky dish to compete with the original sky. And so the thinking was, hey, it'd be so easy if we just put these dishes up and we can broadcast content. Well, eventually what happened is the internet started delivering content, infinite media companies could start becoming delivery content. And all of a sudden you could get broadcasts of activities in real time from YouTube and other types of channels, thus eroding even the classic model definition. If you invested a huge amount of money in copper infrastructure, and now the world all of a sudden moved to fiber, your actual value as a business, if your only job is to reduce friction, can actually become very, very eroded as you all of a sudden become the trip of friction because the company and the technology evolves away from you. So let's take a look quickly at how software-based valuations have actually evolved because in these big, big shifts, all of a sudden tech just became the best reason ever to invest. So if you wanted to invest in a tech company, you were just all of a sudden far cooler than the other investor. You were far more informed and it was always going to be a better thing. And so we talked about it at the beginning when it was all uh, people in lab coats. Tech was a power company. You needed a power utility level of capital and high margins for fixed tech with lab coats. So at that point, tech companies looked and felt very, very similar 
to companies that like were like utilities and other things. So you'd see a power utility company valued very similar to a technology company in the 1970s. Around the 80s, players like Microsoft start writing software and distributing media. So to get software out, you needed to put it on a disk or a floppy or a thing of some type and then get it to people. So even today, software companies still use terms that came from the hardware and logistics businesses like TVs and other things do of distribution channel, distributors, value-added resellers. They have the same models that, that they built based on their days when buying a copy of Office for Microsoft involved 50 floppy disks that you had to install one after the other after the other. Now, the world's a little bit different, but back then in the 80s, it was a high cost of hardware, which was keeping them down. But this model was pretty cool. I can write this thing once. It might cost me a million dollars to do it. But the second copy is 10 cents. The third copy is 10 cents. The fourth copy is 10 cents. The fifth copy is 10 cents. So all of a sudden, these valuations started becoming amazing because there were high fixed costs and almost zero or trivial uh, marginal cost. Now, so much so in the 80s, they still had some marginal cost because of media. But as the 90s and the 2000s moved in, the cost of the hardware to run software changed. Consumers of software grew. The internet made distribution nearly downloadable and automatic. And all of a sudden, you're still writing software once. And now you're downloading it as an app. And so now that you're downloading that app, Subscriptions become common. The, the way of paying for consuming that technology changes from an upfront big capital rental model like was in the 70s in towards a very fluid pay per consumption type model. That caused the market to go crazy. So valuation started happening in a very, very aggressive way. So all of a sudden, if you were tech anything, you were worth 100 times more than a reasonable person would have thought you should be worth. And interestingly enough, you still have in today, a bunch of gold rushes like Tesla, for example, that are so highly based on confidence and faith rather than fundamentals, that if the CEO decides that he is going to spend a little bit more time potentially acquiring another company, you can tank the value of the asset by 15 or 20 percent in one shot. And normal companies with detailed fundamentals that are hugely asset rather than confidence backed can't history tell us fluctuate 25 percent in one day. But if you are extremely bubble backed and if you're consensus driven, everybody just knows you're cool kind of backed, then you tend to live in a valuation model of your own. So the one thing for that we must all understand in technology is that physics still apply. And if you guys are helping people make investment decisions with regards to technology, there are still some fundamental questions that just because you're in technology, you're not exempted from. How big is the market you're in? What's your cost of acquiring a customer? What's the long-term value of your customer? What do you do differently from your competitors? How many competitors do you anticipate in your market in the next year? What is your fixed to variable cost ratio? These are valid questions that follow the rules of corporate physics that just because you're a tech company, you are not immune to. So these are the things that are very quickly in this great correction that's been happening over the last couple of years in tech, that physics are still applied. I was involved when I was at Microsoft with buying a company, Skype, that had lost money every single day of its life and was sold for $7 billion and then still effectively written off a couple of years later. They couldn't figure out what to do with it. But that was the quintessential 2010s-ish, 2000s, Wolf of Wall Street business model that just kind of said, focus on the gloss and don't worry about the underlying business model that still people turn up here in London and Old Street with a pitch deck that just basically says, I have an idea. I'm going to lose money for my entire career. Uh, users are my currency, whatever that actually means, not real money. And I don't have to ever do revenue because I'm just going to get a whole bunch of users and then I'll eventually pawn it off to somebody else who's richer and dumber than we are. So speaking of pawning stuff off on people that are richer and dumber than we are, let's talk about some exciting technologies. First, blockchain. And this is a fantastic one. As you can see here, my friend Walt Disney, I use blockchain to store all my animations. Walt Disney, 1953. Complete BS, right? Walt Disney did not actually say that, but I just remind you how graphically beautiful and compelling you could put stuff in that almost makes you suspend your disbelief in technologies. So what is blockchain? I'll give you a very simple, simple, simple background. One, let's do a deal. 
in our closed community, you and me, let's do a deal. Step one of blockchain. Step two, let's agree the deal terms and we're gonna get somebody to notarize them. That's step two in a blockchain. Three, let's tell people in our community about the deal. That's it. If you wanna understand what blockchain is, it is no different. It is no different than a handshake deal where you sold your car for somebody else. The difference is there's a notary, it's not the government this time, it's another com complete system. But blockchains are basically a way of giving you storage of a piece of information, we call that the ledger, and then the network of people who join a specific piece of information flow to understand that something happened. The biggest part of the blockchain is that it actually provides some type of a ledger. So there is a consensus driven thing that tells you that something happened. Contrary to popular belief, blockchains are not all public. The vast majority of blockchains are private blockchains. So they're enterprise driven blockchains, driven by companies like R3 with their quarter product, the Hyperledger product. There's a whole bunch of other increasing blockchain do-it-yourself kits that allow a customer and a big company or a group or a network of people to deploy a blockchain technology that is private to that community. For example, the Italian payment system is moving towards blockchain implementations to ensure that big bank and capital market transfers can be notarized in a certain way. And blockchains are very, very specific. People mistake a blockchain as a technology with cryptocurrencies, which we'll differentiate in a second. Cryptos use blockchain-like technologies, but blockchains do a lot more than just a cryptocurrency. And actually, most cryptocurrencies are bad examples because they are semi-private blockchains, so you can participate in them by mining and by the act of joining a type of network, but they're still consensus-driven, and you can throw out nodes and a whole bunch of other stuff that, that isn't quite normal. So the other thing that you need to understand about blockchain is that privacy is a problem. And once you've minted and mined a transaction flow, especially in public blockchains that are like Ethereum based that are doing smart contracts and hey, we sold something on the block and we, we did a smart contract for an NFT or something like that, you can't erase that. Because by very definition, the next transaction refers to the previous transaction, which refers to the previous transaction, which refers to the previous transaction. So there's a lot of privacy concerns if you're trying to now, six years later, invoke German privacy law and say you want the right to be forgotten against something that cryptographically makes that impossible to actually do. So not every piece of technology is immediately having the same types of benefits as others do. So let's quickly scan the pieces of blockchains. There is a, a block, nodes, confirmations, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, but basically what it means is if I wanna do a deal with you, I'm gonna tell somebody who's a third party to this deal about our deal. We're both gonna agree it and sign it off. They're going to make that and put a stamp on it. And then we are going to give the reward for the people who did a stamp. That's how the business model works. And we are gonna then issue the proof of work certificate that this transaction has now actually happened. That's basically how the pieces of blockchain put together. In terms of the market in blockchain, it's huge. So there are hundreds and dozens of players, depending on what you're talking about, minting, mining, whether you're talking about gateways to interface between blockchain derived currencies and actual real uh, fiat currencies, whether you're talking about payments, enterprise solutions for them to be able to use it in healthcare, all sorts of other stuff, identity, one of the most important thing in any blockchain network, other than the simple cryptos, is most enterprise and big blockchain networks are actually no network. So you have to get some type of identity before you can join the network and you have to be vouched for. You can't just join a real estate transaction network being anonymously on the dark web. Your transactions won't be valid. There's a lot of rules that go in place to the most of use cases of blockchain that have nothing actually to do with people's expectations of the crypto uh, derivative. So what's a blockchain really about? It's about reduced friction. So we can store data and we can store data immutably. The type of movies that we've ever seen where somebody goes to a keyboard and goes click, 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 click. I've just wiped out Kamala's net worth. She's got no money. I've taken money out of all of her bank accounts, out of everything that she's ever owned. She's now bankrupt. If you've just seen quickly those James Bond movies, blockchain makes that by definition impossible because you would never be able to establish consensus for a foreign actor to be able to just all of a sudden wipe out systems. Whereas if you're storing something in a single database that you have no idea and no observability to the public, or at least to a consensus group, 
then it makes changing a database record very simple, but changing the whole blockchain is impossible to actually immute. The real competitor for, database, for blockchain technology is actually databases. The vast majority of companies that have had blockchain sandboxes and blockchain demo labs and blockchain this and blockchain that have found that some cases it's a problem looking for a solution in case, unless you've got very specific drivers of blockchain, like you need the whole world to see the specific transaction, or you want your whole community to see a specific transaction, you want to make the transaction immutable. So business cases like big payments and property are great business cases for blockchain because they happen, capital payments and property and ledgers and bonds and other financial instruments happen relatively infrequently. But you take a look at a Visa or a MasterCard replacement using blockchain, and you're going to run into the fact that the mining algorithms don't like millions of transactions per second, like small payments of tap and go for 57 cents can actually do. So it's not a technology right now that cryptographically can fit for everything. And the promise of the technology was that it's very decentralized, very secure. But the reality was that a lot of components are centralized across bigger networks. And if they weren't, you wouldn't be hear things in the news of a $600 million swindle of this type of chain, this coin got done for that amount of stuff. They still have centralization points. But the blockchain is here for good. Ignore anybody saying it's never going to work. It does work. It does have a place. And it's basically a place for infrequent, slower transactions, still in the millions per day, but not in the millions per second that you want to be able to clearly observe. So those are the things a little bit about the blockchain in terms of what we're learning. Now, let's get quickly to crypto because we don't have much time. So William Shakespeare, I do all my online shopping using my crypto wallet. So crypto, it's built on a variety of blockchain networks. It's part currency, part commodity. So this is really interesting. It's got two different market behaviors. First, crypto will behave like a floating exchange and medium of payment because it does have payment rails built into the concept of how cryptos are built. So you all of a sudden think you use it for payments. But it actually behaves on a market basis more like a commodity. So if you track it, it's more like gold, or it's more like other behaviors in terms of its commodity-like behavior, even though gold doesn't have payment rails where you can tap and go by paying with gold in financial instruments. So it has a weird proxy characteristic of a commodity and a weird proxy characteristic of a payment mechanism. It's low transaction speed still due to the mining characteristics. So to make something be able to execute really quickly if you're waiting for 10 or 20 or 30 seconds on for a mining cycle to complete, most cryptocurrencies lack the immediacy of being able to execute according to the normal pay mechanism. So for day to day, they might not be the most relevant. It is complete rubbish that block cryptocurrencies are unsafe. The vast majority of retail uh, fiat currencies in the world are equally unbacked. You could argue that the US dollar and maybe a few other currencies in the world are actually asset backed, but ever really since the Bretton Woods collapse, Britain's pound is certainly not backed by anything. And having saying that Bitcoin or Ethereum is completely unsafe because it is completely unbacked and not uh, regulated by a government is actually misleading at best because governments can do a whole bunch of things through secondary tertiary vehicles to manipulate their currency. But other than maybe two or three governments in the world, you can't really manipulate your currency against the market for such a long time. You just have to look at the UK collapsing out of the European rate exchange rate mechanism to remember the last time a medium sized economy tried to go against the market. Eventually, everybody runs out of the ability to do. In cryptocurrencies, asset backing, as we've seen recently with USDTC and other coins, is just as hard as any other currency. If you're going to try to prop up accidentally or you're going to try to prop up even algorithmically a whole bunch of types of coins and networks, it's just not going to work. And as a exchange, exchanges are very interesting in crypto because they make a transaction by effectively doing a buy transaction immediately against the sell transaction of another coin. So I'm going to buy some of Kamala's coin, and I'm going to sell some of Professor Garrett's coins at the same time, and I will execute those transactions immutably at the same time, and I will take a little bit of a difference between as a spread for the majority of my operation. But there's nothing magic about a crypto exchange. Almost anybody can do it because it is effectively two private citizen wallet transactions. You're just doing it for a third party. But because an exchange has to be public in order to get the volumes to make it profitable, by very definition, they're going to be found by the regulators. 
you're going to be telling people that you are a crypto exchange because you need to attract business. Unless you're going to try to say, I'm a private Russian oligarch asset backed yacht exchange of some type, and I'm not going to tell anybody because I'm a private club, just about every type of exchange will have to, by definition, make itself public. And therefore, when it makes itself public, it will at some point be uh, susceptible to mandatory or potentially uh, you know, voluntary regulation. So if you take a look at the next passes, the players are lots and lots of coins and currencies. Just about everybody can almost make a coin. You just need a private club of people that buy into your consensus. In other words, we call them miners. You get a private club of people. You issue a coin of whatever other type you want it. And you now start using that coin for some type of value. And it's worth, just like fine arts or anything else, it's worth whatever people are willing to pay. If Dogecoin all of a sudden has a tweet from Elon Musk, people just think all of a sudden it's cool. You're willing to pay $2 for a Dogecoin where yesterday you were willing to pay 45 cents for a Dogecoin. It is, there's no sentiment. It's, it's, it's sentiment. There's no logic to it. It is any type of completely virtual asset is worth whatever somebody else is willing to pay. As somebody who recently did an NFT of $2.8 million of the first tweet, thinking they were going to sell it for 400, uh, sorry, for 4 million, or I think the number was 4 million, or they thought they were going to get 45 million for it, and they got 300,000 at an auction. The market basically sentiment just changed, and people realized that having a screenshot that was cryptographically verified of a JPEG file of graphics was actually not worth $40 million, and the person got caught out. And that's because it's entirely market sentiment driven. If you take a look then at bigger valuations, I want you to try your attention to this. This diagram was done when Bitcoin was at $5,000 a BTC. And the biggest competitor that was up and coming was Ethereum at $165. So note the difference between the two valuations. Ethereum, obviously, I think right now is trading somewhere around $2,000. I don't have to check what Bitcoin is. But take a look, even a couple of years ago in 2017, how many different coins on a daily basis were already trading and people were getting into or getting out of. And I also, for posterity, draw your attention to USDT down there at a dollar one before a run on it completely collapsed it last week. So the market has got lots of coins. It's got a lot of price changes, and there's a lot of former coin courses. But what you can't doubt is the cryptocurrency market by market cap. So you see big Bitcoin as the big, big dog in the over trillion dollars. That was already a year ago. I haven't found a more recent graph than this. You see Ethereum so, so, so far behind it. And then you see the rest of the type of coins. You see Tether, that got destroyed. Cardano is probably in second place now, and there's been a couple of other events. But the market points that I want you to draw is anyone can, so anyone does. So you need to think very carefully in that model of what you're buying into, what you're not doing, what it is the asset that you're going for, because if you want it like a currency, like treat it like a commodity, you better understand what drives its behaviors like you understand a commodity. So investing in crypto requires probably a commodity-like attention to details in terms of cycles, in terms of movements, and in terms of activities. So quick summary on crypto. It stores value like a currency, but there is an expectation of appreciation like a commodity. You can transact in it because it's got payments rails by definition, and it's got some type of a real uh, competitor uh, and a competitor type uh, landscape. So those competitors are the real status quo. They're real currencies and they're commodities and potentially, as we've heard in the previous session, a stable coin backed by some other type of asset like US dollars. And the only difference between USDTC and a, a different type of a government backed stable coin is potentially the central bank of that country committing further exchange currency reserves to, to manipulate the price to keep it within the allocated band. But really, it's the same as trying to artificially prop up any asset by converting other assets. It will follow exactly the same rules. The difference is does the government want to prop up its bond price? Does it want to prop up its other yields? Does it want to prop up? you know, whatever asset, whatever currency, does it want to manipulate that? It will use exchange currency reserve systems and potentially monetary policy like it would in any other coin. The promise of crypto is it's completely decentralized, very secure and very private and it's an amazing investment. The realities are just like blockchain that it's based on, 
many of those components are centralized as they can be stolen. Security is about the same historically now as other coins. Privacy is higher because of the way that wallets work. And that's actually quite powerful. Um, but generally speaking, it has similar characteristics to cash. So there's no nothing linking a 50 pound note or a hundred dollar coin to you. So there's nothing saying that this is Camille's hundred dollar bill. So that's probably like you need to think about a cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency from an anonymity perspective looks and feels just like cash, which means if cryptocurrencies are the way you think you're going to bypass scrutiny, you're eventually when you move back to the five to the fiat currency world, you're going to have the same money laundering and source of funds, UN AML 8851 restrictions that exist when you're taking cash and converting it into the actual fiat currency that is observable. So th there's a lot of short term privacy and other types of things, but the regulators have shown that they're going to watch the exchanges and they're going to watch the exchanges of value for when you move it back to transactional currency that, that actually they're going to observe. And they're going to observe by the payments companies, by open banking, or the other types of API schemes. They're going to observe the major custodians. And you're seeing the European Central Bank already create this concept called the virtual asset service provider, which is a legislated banking licensing observable thing. And you're going to see them take that type of approach. The metaverse, right. So the metaverse is an interesting, interesting context. It is an iteration of the internet as a single virtual world. It's the next version of the internet. It uses virtual reality and augmented reality headsets. That's what apparently it's supposed to do. Uh, colloquially, Wikipedia defines it as a network of 3D virtual worlds. So here's an interesting example, somebody selling you land in the metaverse, somebody selling you a city on the moon verse, the virtual reality of the moon. You can buy a castle if you can't afford a real one. Now, probably most people that the former speaker was referring to in the conference probably can buy their own castle. But for those of us that can't, you can buy one in the metaverse, um, which basically is involving the creation of a next generation of the evolution of the internet, which uses this virtual world uh, type construct. So how do we define the different layers of the metaverse? Well, there are games and social and esports and some theaters and shoppings of stuff you might wanna do online. And if you put this interface of these glasses on, you might be able to participate into that virtual mall. And just as you're willing to pay money to be seated optimally close to the food court and next to the movie theater in an American shopping mall, that tends to be a one, grade of retail space, your metaverse shop might want to be in a similar place. And thus, if you want that type of place, I'm going to put a premium on that. And I'm going to sell you virtual land uh, tranches around my community. But effectively speaking, you still need to create a community that participates in that point. It's the first thing you need to understand about the metaverse. Heavily, it's being driven right now by games and by gaming and the gamification of individual human actions, because that community of people tend to have a very high predisposition for innovation. And they tend to not mind taking a phone like this and then sticking it in a piece of glass on top of your thing, which has an accelerometer. And they tend to be able to do a little bit of things that, that other generations, like even myself now, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond hope. I don't think I'll ever stick my mobile phone to my face so that I can interact in the digital world. If I want to yell at my son, I'll go up to his room and do it. There are just some things that is just for me, I'm, I'm beyond that. But it's not to say that the next generation, the next 10, 15 years won't change. It's also driven by the requirement of a more human interfaces. So the one thing that we should talk about is we mentioned quickly that in, in, in the beginning of this conversation, that the interface changes everything. And we got a mouse and that changed everything that caused cloud. And we got a, you know, sorry, a mouse, sorry, caused the client server data centers and the mobile phone devices really accelerated the cloud and the mainframe really forced to on site. It's not really clear to the industry what a augmented reality device will force in its evolution. So it's kind of like this next generation of interface that the world's kind of like, if you remember the 3D glasses in the seventies, they made then their, their return briefly in the 2010s when all TVs were now becoming 3D. And if you put those glasses on, you could get a 3D Blu-ray, if you remember that, and you could watch those movies. Some of that stuff became a little bit dorky and a little bit kind of eh. So, so Metaverse plays, if you, if you, if you listen you know, to, to the critics, 
might have a little bit of that type of thing. And if you're a proponent of the metaverse, you will be wanting all of this technology. You'll be saying, look, Fortnite is a metaverse experience play. Apple is a human interface play. So if you construct your metaverse definition broadly enough, you could basically put every major logo in tech in the definition of the metaverse. But more specifically, it's characterized around experience of content, the discovery of content and the creators of content, generally from the video gaming and other type of entertainment space, creating consumable environments that you want to spend your time virtually in. So if, you're, if you've seen the movie Matrix, basically it's the opposite of the blue pill. You literally want to take whichever the pill it was, it goes back to the Matrix and plugs you back in. That's basically the metaverse play. Eventually speaking, you're willing to pay money for your beautiful house by the sea in the metaverse because it's got some cool digital 3D characteristics. It's a one-off. It's got its own payment system, its own world. And like Second Life, kind of kicked off in the early 2000s. Basically, the metaverse is, is an attempt to do that, but with a lot more capital players. What's the challenge? And by the way, this picture here is Mark Zuckerberg controlling Mark Zuckerberg, which is kind of frightening for me. Um, it's evolved everything. So the metaverse is, is internet 5.0 is a new generation of everything. What's the competitor to the metaverse? Well, the real world. That's one. The second is regulators. And the third is the current internet. The promise of the metaverse is that it's super immersive. You'll want to live there and it's a gold rush. Get in on it now. If you're not in on the metaverse, you're nowhere. If you're not investing in the metaverse, you're nowhere. Think carefully about the rules that we talked about this morning on, on the physics of investments. If the business says it's metaverse, how is it going to get its customers? How is it going to retain them? What's its competitors? What's it actually doing? What's the cash revenue model? Do not fall for the fact that it just says metaverse is an automatic reason to print money. The market has taught us that the interface is everything. So the mouse, super important. The keyboard, super important. The thing stuck onto the phone, that's the bet you're having to make about the metaverse. And you have to think very carefully about that. So it will also gonna require a huge amount of tech power and tech shape. So the conversation isn't whether the internet will go to 5.0 and take metaverse-like characteristics. It's do we have the resolution? Do we have the right level of data networks yet? Do we have all of that stuff to make augmented reality really, really cool yet? And so I think out of all of the three technologies that we've talked about in this case, the metaverse is by far the one that's furthest behind and has a long way to go. But as the data and computing power and thus battery life catches up on these devices, they'll become a lot more compelling. So a couple of two approaches then. So if I've talked a little bit about technology, I just wanna highlight quickly on two interesting businesses that have taken these types of approaches of understanding their valuation, understanding their tech model, understanding what they're doing and how. And I wanna talk about very, very quickly on, on these two uh, stories that I really like. First of all is a UK business called Sportsfy. Now they've started exactly the right type of transformation in the way that they did. They're a classic business, team of about 12 or 13 people, and they do sports financing. And what they've realized is by adding a technology platform so that clubs could finance themselves, players could finance themselves, you could give, the, the players could now all of a sudden in the context of the platform print their own moments. So for example, I've just scored the winning goal on this Saturday's match. I'm gonna print that as an NFT on that platform. And all of a sudden a platform that was intended for communications between players, agents, and clubs can be a platform that enables connection to fans. Imagine if the fans can all of a sudden get a play on being able to crowdsource a transfer fee between a club to another place. So in that case, they understood where the friction was they're applying the pressure to the friction of that point, and they're using a tech platform in the context of a business model that's really, really quite powerful. So this is a type of example of a new type of innovative business that was fast to capital, that's easily fundable, and is a kind of a model that's following within these larger, broader rules that we talked about. Next one's a structure called FTB, which is also another really interesting one. And the reason I like these guys is that they're basically a banking as a service provider. So they're, go they're going after people who used to have to beg a bank to give them a license and then beg a payments company to help them out in order to build a financial technology or financial inclusion app, the market was very, very deep. So, so the conversation that I loved about this is this white part of the slide. They understood who the big gorillas were, they understood who their market was, and they understood who's succeeding. So you've got companies like Rails Bank and Clear Bank now that are decimating 
normal European and American banks. You've got Plaid and Stripe and these guys that have come out of nowhere as tech companies because they understood that the big gorillas didn't want to invest and innovate. HSBC and Chase Manhattan are very happy taking money from people. And if they, and if they ever make a mistake, they know the government will bail them out because they're too big to fail. And so they have no interest in turning themselves into a bank as a service. They don't want to help developers build applications on their platforms. It's not their business model. Their business model is all of the stuff our previous speaker was talking about. So the big gorillas aren't interested in this market. And then the expectation was the regulators. So don't worry, the regulators will save us. The regulators have never so, uh, saved telecoms companies. The regulators have never ever so, uh, saved payments companies and the regulators with regards to competition have it in for banks. So they won't necessarily save them. They will deregulate the market like PSD2 did and, and PSD1 and now PSD3 is coming in Europe where they created a gigantic area of 32 countries of innovation that if you can open up one service in one of those countries, you can open it up in the other. And the rules is we're not gonna tighten down on that money stuff. We're gonna allow crypto, but we're gonna regulate it. We're gonna allow all these new exchange frontiers, but we're gonna regulate them. And we're gonna make sure that the big heavy fat gorillas aren't actually gonna be involved. So the reason I like this FinTechno Bank construct is because they did a very deep analysis of why they would succeed because they knew the other lanes on the highway and how fast each of them were moving. So I think that was it from, from my conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I hope this has been engaging and uh, love to hear from the rest of the panel and uh, any other questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. That was really an incredible presentation. And um, so I would want to invite our um, panelists to share now, but I, I want to say, remember, governance for us is oversight. And as uh, Fred said, some of these things, we may not be as willing to, to embrace it, but the, the rate of change over the last few years has really been extensive. And so um, the world is, is coming. So we need to understand how it's impacting our universe if we are going to ensure that uh, we make the right plans and put the right things in place to be able to do this. Um, so Fred, if it's okay for me to ask you to um, stop sharing so that I will then invite our panelists who is someone um, I've been in the region for a number of years. Louis Kingley is in fact co-founder of Carry Pay and has had to deal with a number of uh, these issues. So Louis, I invite you now to share your perspective for, for the region and to respond to a lot of what Fred has shared. Well, well, thank you first off, Kamala, for the invitation and Bob Garrett for everybody for organizing and Tom for a great uh, keynote to kick this off. You know, I think some of the things he touched on with the way taxes are moving and the way governments are moving is actually going to accelerate the adoption of a lot of these technologies that Fred just touched on. You know, the, some of those, those aspects that Fred highlighted, the, the privacy, the liquidity aspect of being able to quickly and easily transfer those funds anywhere, anytime with no intermediaries uh, I, I see as being one of the really major elements to really change how, you know, the transfer of wealth is occurring, not just today, but in 10 years, when we can use these technologies to establish some kind of a contract today that will place our assets in escrow and automatically distribute those out to whoever we decide. <clears throat> at whatever point in time we decide, um, you know, I think that's really powerful. And, uh, you know, to go back to one of those slides that Fred had talking about the, you know, the public versus private blockchains, where the, the public elements of it are really just what was your account or your address that received those funds. So the even when a transaction might be considered public, it's only really fully public to those who know who's on either end of it, right? So the transaction, the fact that the transaction happened is completely public, but most people in the world will never know who was on either end of that transaction. So, you know, especially in the context of the Caribbean, 
a lot of countries don't yet have any regulation or legislation around digital assets or cryptocurrencies at all. So if those things are not considered uh, you know, value or legitimate stores of value, they're also not taxed, uh, which you know, is, is potentially a pretty large loophole for some folks right now. You know, I know some family businesses that are moving that way really just as a hedge against inflation and whatever market conditions may occur. And folks that are getting into the, you know, the, the Bitcoin mining space in some of our countries where, you know, especially in Trinidad and Tobago, where there is a lot of excess energy on the power grid. Um, you know, there are folks finding ways to take their existing family assets and turn that into something that is going to be there in 10 years, 20 years. Uh, and another great point Fred made was there is a huge number of currencies out there and tokens and projects and crazy things that we have no way of knowing what will last. Uh, you know, I, I think about the only thing that I can be even 98% sure of is that at least Bitcoin will continue to be here in some form in 10 years. Um, and just to touch a little bit on the, you know, the speed and transaction volume and scale side of it, you know, today, most of the blockchains we know about and think about absolutely right, you know, slow, not really feasible for a 50 cent transaction. Uh, but again, there are some innovations happening on top of the Bitcoin platform network, um, namely the Lightning Network, which allows us to send a few pennies for uh, one two thousandth of a dollar. So, you know, 0. 0.0005 cents, I think. Um, and that goes in two seconds or less anywhere in the world, anytime. Uh, and it's completely private. So I, I think there are a lot of these technologies coming that, you know, the younger generation is getting into and really helping families take these technologies up. Uh, you know, even within my family, I've uh, convinced numerous folks to convert most of their existing wealth into uh, digital assets, which, you know, I think for, for those of us who may be in a position to inherit, I think we would probably rather have those than, you know, even real estate in some cases, which can be a bit less liquid and more dependent on market trends uh, in a given geography. So, you know, I think there's a lot to talk about and I'm sure folks have a lot of questions. Um, you know, we could go down a lot of technology rabbit holes. I think Fred did a really great job prepping us and giving some context. So I'm curious what what the audience has and what kind of questions we can we can help clarify. Thanks very much, Louis. Um, and, and I agree, you know, it's it's such a new area and a lot of us will have a, a, a lot of questions. But I, so I want to start it off and I want to ask Fred, um, you know, blockchain seems to be such a, a fundamental thing. Can you share with us what really is the driving force? you know, that, that is pushing this because it's the foundation to me that seems to be allowing us to do so many other things like the, the digital currencies. I think Louis mentioned the best point, which is the privacy element of it and, and selected implementations giving an extreme degree of privacy. Also uh, transaction, let's say tamper resistance. So once a blockchain completes a transaction, the only way to undo it is by another transaction. And that would have to, again, go through the same consensus of both parties. Imagine if you're a payments company that just took a $10,000, an airline that took a $10,000 payment that is now proven to be far fraudulent. Visa will literally strip that $10,000 from you the next time and put the risk on you as a merchant. Blockchain network could not allow that to be possibly happening where other people could inflect and go into your flow. So I think that there's a lot of good, I mean, Lewis will tell us more than, than I could, but a lot of really good payments related uh, and value related characteristics of blockchain derived cryptos. 
Okay, yeah. and I love the two examples you shared with respect to the, the UK sports company and um, the, the FinTech bank. So um, if you and Louis can share with us, you know, what is needed to really move into that type of environment um, and, and how can the Caribbean move into that space? Wow, well, there's... There's a lot that's needed, I suppose, but uh, to Fred's point, it's still traditional business in the sense that you need customers, you need people to pay. So, you know, there are, of course, a lot of companies in the Caribbean that have a global client base that have vendor relationships around the world. And, you know, it depends really, I think one of the points Fred made about the, the solutions that are being implemented today. A lot of folks have reached for a blockchain because it's the it's the hype, um, and in some cases it it does actually make sense. So, you know, if we if we really want to look at some of the traceability aspects of you know what some of these businesses are you know bringing in and producing, uh, there's I think a big opportunity for interoperability, right? There there are standards emerging. Uh, from the world, you know, global community and different elements that will help our businesses be more competitive, help them actually integrate and more quickly work with other businesses around the world. So I think that's one huge opportunity is to not necessarily use it for payments, but for using it, use it to track the flow of, of information or goods or, you know, other tangible things. Um, you know, and that's just one. I'm sure, Fred, you've got several examples you could share as well. Yeah, so I think, so I'm involved right now in a project in, to build the UK's blockchain transfer property network. And that's a really fantastic use case that I'm really proud to be involved in. Because if you think about what these guys are doing is that they're attacking a national level infrastructure. Visa and MasterCard, really, they have their foundational basis on consortiums that had to build for market failure where the government didn't have a, a fast payment system. So Bank of America started the Visa whole program. MasterCard came a different way. But effectively speaking, somebody moved first and created market infrastructure. And the interesting part about this is that the, what these guys are doing is they're creating the first concept of a programmable transaction. So we all know in our family office business, sometimes you're doing a complicated deal or a merger acquisition, we create a deal room. We put data into that deal room. We sign NDAs to protect that deal room. We go through a variety of processes. And when we're ready, we execute the transaction or we walk away. Now the technology is allowing us to do the same thing. So we create a deal room for the property. The conveyancers, the attorney, so both on the buyer and the seller side, the land registry, everybody can participate in that deal room, get consensus on the correct information, escrow the asset titles in the right way. And when everything is ready to go, provide instruction to the real-time growth settlement system to actually execute the payments. The, uh, the mortgage holder released the funds, the seller got money, the estate agent got stuff, the, the transaction changed. So these concepts of rich programmable transactions, they become you know, the future. With regards to the way that we would talk about the opportunity for the Caribbean, you guys have the most fantastic environment of creativity around you. And in terms of building a venture, there are three things you've got to get right. You've got to understand, and the Caribbean technology providers, the Caribbean entrepreneurs, they know their market. They understand their market. Now, the, the next part of building any tech venture would be to identify the market gap. And that's where participation and working with you guys in this institute, for example, can help identify the difference between an idea and a, and a technologically executable plan, which leads us then to the third part, which is to execute. And cloud and other technologies have made it so much more possible that your teams of execution no longer have to be entirely res resident in the Caribbean. You can leverage a global skill set, keeping the structures, the asset, the brain power of who's doing the big decisions, but you can outsource a variety of intellectual capital labor to lower costs and lower other jurisdictions. So the Caribbean has got a fantastic advantage in that it's, it's, it's capital rich, it's ideas rich, 
and it's got a regulatory flexibility in the market that could turn the Caribbean into the world's next fintech, prop tech, envirotech, and health tech powerhouse. Nothing stopping it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The it is really a a blue ocean in some regards in a regulatory perspective. You know, we've seen. Barbados try and make some strides to you know, be the first country to open up an embassy in the metaverse, but more so to be progressive towards this technology where there's still not that many jurisdictions that are completely friendly to all the elements. You know, some are okay with digital currencies or exchanges. Some are okay with different types of assets, whether that's tokenized real estate or something else. Uh, but to really have that enabling environment, whether that is, you know, going back to the, the history of, you know, low tax for some of these international businesses or otherwise providing incentives, you know, there's a, a big opportunity there because the infrastructure is good. Uh, generally speaking, you know, the, it, it's a desirable place, especially for companies to come spend a week for an offsite and get all of that intellectual capital from around the world together in one place. There are numerous Caribbean entrepreneurs I know, you know, uh, gallivanting through Europe or wherever that, you know, they would love to bring their teams together back in the Caribbean for a week or a month to build and work there. Uh, you know, so I think there's, there's definitely an opportunity to cultivate those type of experiences and those types of opportunities. You know, I, I think we can see some of the uh, early attempts at that in uh, El Salvador, which is not quite in the Caribbean, but you know where they've not only legalized Bitcoin as legal tender, but are putting in place a lot of different laws to make running a Bitcoin focused business very tax and very uh, you know attractive to entrepreneurs. And whether that succeeds or fails, you know I think time will tell, but it does provide a lot of you know, opportunity for regulators in the Caribbean to look at what's working and what's not and adjust. So we don't have to be the first movers. We can learn from those mistakes, uh, you know, and really make that enabling environment. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Louis. Um, Camille, I see your hand. Yes, when I heard Federico talking, it reminded me that here in Jamaica, we are engaging in an e-titling project whereby our land registry, we will no longer have paper titles, but we'll have e-titles. And when you describe the data room, that is kind of how it's going to be. The lawyers on both sides will engage. And then when we know the banker is releasing the money, then, you know, this is for the mortgage company. So we we have I don't know if it's as sophisticated as what you're describing, Federico, but I certainly found what you were sharing there very interesting. Well, property uh, is is a fantastic case, both in terms of tokenizing an asset uh, and creating uh, a digital fluid asset. Imagine if you could tokenize your title in Jamaica. So now you've taken you own a property. Uh, it's worth, let's say, uh, 1 million US dollars all up. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could coin that and mint a, a digital asset for that? And if you needed to lean against that asset, part exchange it, part collateralize that, because let's say your daughter is now going to school in the US and you'd like $25,000 available in the US, the modern mm -hmm. credit world wouldn't give you a $25,000 loan in the United States back against a, quote, foreign asset. But the rise of new modern digital escrow systems that will be backed off from property and tokenized properties with potential lien on the exchange saying, by the way, it's just like you did a mortgage backed loan. If you could tokenize quickly your wholly owned operation and you need $50,000, you could get that probably tomorrow and at a low risk because your lender is going to be able to accept the part ownership of that digital asset without having to go and touch the exchange again. The exchange will vouch for this title being yours, but you can now transact with that asset a lot more quickly. So, so we see a couple of things happening in terms of the tokenization of, of, of actual land register exchange as they go digital, mm -hmm. but digital shouldn't mean I will send you a PDF. Digital should mean mm -hmm. I will give you an entire 
uh, basically cryptographically entire token that you can then part split it into micro coins and be able to use it in a lot more fluid way. And that's really where we see a lot of very, very powerful innovation. And in the case of the company that, um, that you know, I'm talking about here in the UK, they're very advanced. They're four years old already. They've been doing a lot of, of technology, a lot of implementation. And I'm, I'm sure you could connect to some of their people to give you some, some really good advice on the types of pitfalls of what to avoid. Mm, thank you. And just to build on that, I think, you know, as we think about all this digital ownership, you know, whether that is a, a land deed or otherwise, it gets back to a question of, you know, do you trust a custodian to manage that ownership for you as you trust your banks now? Or do you as an individual or as a family want to be your own custodians? So a lot of this technology is really dependent on, you know, there, there's the famous saying, you know, not your keys, not your crypto. And when we talk about keys, that's basically just a magic marker that when you sign it, you can, nobody else has that exact same magic marker. And we can go verify that that signature belonged to your marker anytime. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of great content out there, but if you are thinking about you know, how to hold assets digitally, you really have to think about how you do that as your own custodian, because most of the, well, all of the confiscations that we've seen in recent history has happened because somebody was using a custodian. Even in the case last year of the, I think the colonial pipeline hack where, you know, a ransom was paid and then you know, the US government goes and says, oh, well, we recovered the ransom. Well, they didn't break Bitcoin. They didn't break into somebody's self custodied Bitcoin wallet and steal that. They went to the exchange that was holding those Bitcoins and said, hey, if you don't give us these, we're going to make sure you get shut down or otherwise cause problems for you. It's the same thing they do with custodians today, right? They can freeze your bank account for basically any reason they want. And if you are considering, you know, how to secure family wealth, really taking the time to research self custody is a really great, you know, going to be a great return on investment. Um, you know, building on that, you know, once you have that self custody, there's also a question of, you know, how do you use that to identify yourself or verify certain data points about yourself in those transactions? Um, as Fred mentioned, there's the virtual asset service provider law that's come out in the UK uh, or not in the, in the EU, which really requires exchanges on either end of a crypto transaction to be able to identify who the holder of that wallet is. Um, almost exactly the same as current wire transactions where the banks on both ends need to know who you are and be able to at least have some idea what the source of those funds were. Um, you know, and of course, as we go through this digital age of having a lot more of our personal information digitized and having, you know, really our identity connected to our assets, uh, there are a lot of different questions of how we do this. Uh, what some of the more promising models or the most promising model, uh, I think has really come out of Canada, which I hesitate to praise them too much now, but, um, you know, their digital identity and authentication framework has been very well thought out and worked on for a decade or more. Uh, and it really gets to a concept called self sovereign identity, where you as an individual uh, or an individual entity should be the sole owner of your data. And you should have that complete, uh, you know, history of who you shared what with and when, um, and the ability to, you know, consent to share your data anytime it's actually needed. But for me as a technologist, the most exciting thing that this enables something called zero knowledge proof, where you can use that information you hold in your wallet about yourself or your assets uh, to essentially prove a true or false thing statement, whether that is, 
you know, you have X amount of assets or you live in a certain jurisdiction, rather than having to reveal all of the underlying information, whether that is account statements or, you know, a letter from the bank or something else, uh, if those documents are held by you in your self-sovereign identity wallet, you can essentially run a cryptographic algorithm on those that just provides a true false. I meet this test. And that stuff is still anchored on a blockchain. So we can still verify that, you know, the individual holder of that information is the correct holder. We can verify that that information hasn't been tampered with, but we can do all of this completely privately. Uh, and I think that's, you know, another area of opportunity on the regulatory side, as we, we recognize that we're all moving towards a world where we have to prove who we are and what we're about digitally all the time. Uh, you know, we need to start thinking about the governance of more than just our, our assets or our, you know, data privacy. How do we take that a step further and ensure that, you know, both in the public and private sector, the best available technologies and regulations are applied to ensure privacy going forward? Well, if I wasn't blown away before, now I am. You know, Peter, I want to invite you to, to join this conversation because I feel completely lost. The, the, the world is changing so very quickly. And, you know, I, I really like that example you gave, Louis, that, that speaks to what Canada did. Because what that means is that, just as you said before, there are precedents being set where we don't have to start from scratch. And the reality is, there are so many gamers in our region. So as, as Fred would have said, these are the people who are the early adopters. So they are ready and waiting as soon as there's anything in place, you know, there will be a, a great movement in, in this universe. So uh, Peter, I want to invite you to, to join the conversation as well, if there are any uh, additional comments or, or questions that, that you want to ask. Yeah, well, uh, I think this actually th th this issue of privacy is built upon very, very strongly from uh, Tom's discussion before on proper structuring, uh, etc. And I think as far as a unified uh, alliance in the Caribbean, and this is where your institute can play a pivotal role, is uh, what does this mean to the Caribbean? Uh, because the issue that we have, uh, of course, it, as, as I've touched upon, but let's go to the top here, and it, it's beyond just family office and alternate worth individuals, but they are certainly a major anchor market. Um, but it leads into all of these other areas, because there's an ecosystem, they are funding uh, directly investments into these new tech innovations, and they're better than the, even the VC world, because the VC world, and I, I give an example, as I may have used before, um, someone I know who was experienced and financially savvy, the VC didn't even hold the capital. They wanted to charge them a, a, a fee of 10% on anything they structured or raised, and they wanted a majority of the company, about 60%. A family office knows full well that they, if they operate in such a predatory way, it won't work, uh, and, and the, 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 the founders won't be empowered. So getting direct money from principal to principal is a key component and where the Caribbean can differentiate itself is being that place where the principals in a safe, trusted environment, knowing where they stand in advance and if they should get bullied by the, the other, um, uh, let's just say elements uh, that are can, trying to control every force of everyone's lives, you'll they'll at least understand that you've done everything in your power to prepare for that. And if you are forced into a position, it's not your doing, it is in fact overriding parties now um, uh, doing so. Now leading into technology, of course, okay, there's many enabling factors here. And I guess this is a key part what I've really taken away from this discussion is of course the, the many enabling factors and for you to choose your own USP, because it's one thing for us to kick ideas, but as, um, as, as, um, as Frederica touched upon, of course, it's about putting together that plan. You need to decide what you want to do. But I've, I've, I'm, a, I'm a big, strong advocate of the idea that um, privacy has a huge component, regardless. Uh, because let's just say you're not a wealthy person. Data theft and, uh, and, and, and crypto, uh, sorry, uh, uh, cyber cr crime and all of these sorts of things are absolutely rampant. I find that they're very rampant even on um, 
people of sort of the, the previous generation that aren't as tech savvy or slightly elderly. I've got friends and family members that have all have had one form of fraud or cyber crime or uh, something like that, um, uh, and unfortunately to their own detriment. So around this, it's not all about, it's, it's great to get the new sexy technology that will be publicly listed and changed. That's good. But on a fundamental basis, they've got to trust you as that safe place first. And if you are considered that trusted safe place first, where you know where you stand, this is where it all comes back to what, the name of your, your institute, it's governance. What is it though? And that's why I'm having these discussions with all of the uh, thought leaders with these separate disciplines that are part of the great wealth transfer because it 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 really will help you define what you want what the problem is what the gap is as fred stated and then putting the plan around that so in my my opinion i i, I think uh, in a world of massively eroded privacy particularly financial privacy and this is not for oligarchs wanting to stash their money in a, in a tidy little haven we're talking about just normal people that want to do normal level business even if it's um, you know, a few, you know, $20,000, uh, if they choose your channel uh, and you've got the ticket and it's going through your gateway, it must, it'd be a better option than going through others. Or, or, or do you want to focus on the, just the high end uh, and then outsource some of those functions as was touched upon? But I think that that's the component. Um, there are certain um, uh, countries like Malta, for example, giving gaming as an example, they focused a bit more on volume. Uh, so it's a great place to sort of structure it there, the tax benefits, et cetera. You could look at somewhere like Gibraltar, where they were focusing a little more on, on of course, the higher end. So you can look at volume, you can look at higher end. I think you, you, you have a, a plethora of choice to cherry pick nation by nation what they want to do. But unified, I think you need to be much more unified on the governance around these, these critical areas of financial privacy. because And that's, again, one drawback of the blockchain on certain areas. If, if you don't want your private affairs, furrowed through forevermore, why on earth would you want your your smart contracts? It's, 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 it's a sacrilege, absolute sacrilege to the old school Swiss model. Um, and again, not to hide anything, but it's just why do you want potential um, litigators? Why do you want potential hijackers, stalkers, hackers, um, or just you know uh, journalists looking for mud uh, to furrow through your affairs? So I think managing that with, again, but, but again, proper pr privacy, proper governance and of course as we touched on our previous um, the ethics around it because again you, you you don't want to be the 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 um home base of, of laundering money for you know uh, drugs um arms and 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 oligarchs of course but but around and around proper fair treatment and i think what thomas touched upon as opposed to um the statutory uh the statutory protections as opposed to just the case law protections uh, are a number of intertwined. So these do really intertwine. I've, I know I've, I've taken this path, but I, I see this technology side of thing as an amazing enabler, but um, do, it, we, we don't want to put the cart before the horse, if that makes sense. The one thing I would add to, to what Peter's just really eloquently said is you have to really think about regulation in this case as pouring concrete into a super massive foundation very slowly. You don't want to overregulate really quickly. You want to do this very slowly, methodically from the ground up. At some point, you're going to need to have some safeguards in place. And it just works for everybody if you just have certain basic stores of value. UNAML 8851, like the anti-money laundering rules, exist for a reason. Most of the Dodd-Frank Act provisions, now I might disagree with the previous speaker in terms of Dodd-Frank wasn't all evil, done by the evil Democratic Republican Party to, or sorry, Democratic Party to, to, to enslave us all. A lot of Dodd-Frank was done for very specific financial reasons, for very specific market stability reasons, and for very specific market, uh, market active. That legislation took 11 years. I would like crypto legislation to take that long too, because it's thought through. It's as lightweight as it possibly can get away with. There's no fad as I'm going to be the regulator to bring it all under control, so I'm going to regulate the stupid. So it's a question that a transition needs to happen over time. But the best way to think about crypto regulation is that eventually at some point having some element of OK. So what's happened in Europe and the virtual asset service provision licenses is that it has actually caused an influx of investment into those crypto assets, into those crypto exchange types, not what was predicted, which was, no, no one's going to go anywhere near Luxembourg now. And Luxembourg is basically the champion of virtual asset service provider licenses. So one of the projects I'm looking at is looking at specifically buying a bank in Luxembourg because of that virtual asset service provider license. And so when you're looking at those evolutions now, 
you think about putting brakes on the car, not to slow it down, but putting it brakes on the car, like in Formula One, to go faster safely. And, and that's really the element of regulation. You, you don't want too much because it kills everybody's buzz, but not enough, you'll hit the wall and it'll come. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think to your point, regulations, it's just about helping the entrepreneurs and the folks in that space know what know where they stand, right? It's not about locking it all down. It's just about giving regulatory clarity. So if folks know that they come set up a business and start doing something, to your point, that's the case law isn't going to change, you know, the, or the statutes won't change in the same way that case law will. So it's really just about giving that clarity uh, and absolutely agree, you know, layering on very slowly. Um, Thank you very much. I think you, you both um, addressed the question from Azam in terms of whether um, more regulations is needed. And, and Fred, I love that analogy you give. You know, with this huge foundation, and but you are dropping the concrete very slowly so that, you know, the, it's a well thought out plan based on information that, that seeks to address exactly what you want to solve. Um, but for me, I, I, I am seeing this as a very exciting area, a very new area. Um, and Peter has given us a lot of food for thought too in terms of how exactly does this region want to address this new area? You know, we have individual countries who are making different steps, some very successfully. Do we want as a region to also have a unified approach? And, and certainly what that means is there is a lot more need for a lot more information and a lot more dialogue that's going to allow all of us to have a, a common understanding of exactly what are those objectives that we are going to pursue and then what may be the best means to be able to achieve that. So I'm not seeing any other questions or comments um, in the chat. Um, so in which case then, if it's okay with everyone, we can finish a little earlier since we took away your half hour break um, earlier. Um, and and I, it is then my pleasure to say thank you very much to Fred and, and to Louis. But before we, I actually say thanks though, I should ask you, Fred, if you have any closing comments or so that you would want to, to share in terms of, uh, you know, some of the thoughts that uh, Peter raised and, and, and what Louis has shared in terms of where we are at in the region right now. I'm really excited for, for the Caribbean region. And you've got the perfect confluence of being able to have some type of regulatory kind of coordination. So you've got a government supranational community basis of which you can have some, some informed conversations to level the playing field across multiple market regulators. So that's an exciting thing that you've got an advantage of that most places, for example, in Southeast Asia and others don't. You do have access to relatively energy surplus type countries. So, so crypto, bit mining, a whole bunch of the other new economy generations are quite positive. You have got high net worth and high capital flows that you can use to, to leverage and shift those changes. Far as I think Peter mentioned it perfectly in terms of the opportunities for the great wealth transfer to, to force a new way of thinking. And, and the Caribbean has got a very, very strong track record of actually being able to execute relaxed but compliant financial innovation. So if you think about all of those different factors confluence, there is market failure in crypto and in, in, in advanced leading edge tech in most other countries in the world. And you haven't poured too much of that concrete yet. So you can avoid fast following off the cliff. You can actually think very carefully about what to do and how. And, and I think market leaders like Lewis in the area will, will guide the region beautifully in terms of the things that, that need to be done. Thank you very much, Fred. Louis, any, any closing comments? Well, well I, you know, I think, again, to echo what Fred said, you know, there is a huge opportunity and it's great to see some of the leadership that's emerging from the Caribbean in this space. You know, very optimistic that the you know the work that Mia Motley is doing to really bring attention to this and show what's possible uh, will be echoed around the region. 
you know, I think we've got a little ways to go in terms of uh, some of the existing governance structures that need to be updated or, um, you know, get over some of the history uh, to allow the region to move forward. Uh, but I think there are a lot of good steps being taken. And I, I think we will see over the next three to five years where a lot is going to change, um, whether it's out of necessity or, you know, foresight uh, it remains to be seen, but uh, it's going to look a lot different in five years than it does today.